Podcast, the Capital Farm Credit Wednesday Night Podcast, our weekly look at the area athletic scene, what happened last week and what's going on this week. I'm here via Zoom with my partner, Dan Youngblood. And tonight, Dan, we talk with Hermley girls basketball coach, Dwayne Hopper, a guy that we've uh, worked with for a number of years. And we've always enjoyed working with this guy. Yeah. In fact, uh, my time out here began uh, with him as a player. I covered him at Wiley and covered him a little bit at Harden Simmons after that. So, uh, I've known Dwayne a long time. I got to see him as a player. Now I'm getting to see him have success as a coach. So that's been really cool, even if it's made me feel a little bit old. But it's it's been really cool. You are old. See, well, I'm getting there. You're old. But, uh, if you're if you're old, what am I? <laughs> I'm not. No comment. I'm a, I'm a mummy. <laughs> but uh, but it's been cool. He's just, he's a guy that's just a winner. I mean, he's won as a player. He helped Wiley get to the state tournament, uh, and then he helped uh, Harden Simmons go on a deep run. Uh, one of the, their deepest run of the the of the uh, Division Three era. So I mean, he's a guy that's won everywhere he's been as a player. Now to come into coaching, he goes and takes Hermley to their first two state champ or so first two state tournament appearances in his first two years. So it's been it's been fun to watch him. And uh, one thing I always kind of respected about him as a player, and I think you see it in his coaching, is he was always kind of that gritty blue collar guy who was never necessarily the most talented but he made the most of what he had. And uh, I think you see that in his teams too. And I think that's a quality of a good coach. So uh, I'm excited to talk to Dwayne tonight. All right, before we get started tonight, we need to thank our primary sponsor, Capital Farm Credit, with offices all over Texas, including Stanford and Abilene. Buy your own slice of Texas with Capital Farm Credit. Together, we're better. And with that, it's time to jump into basketball. Generally, we'll start off at 1A, Dan, because we've got a lot of teams that are of interest in that area in girls basketball, typically, and that's on an annual basis. Yeah, and the big thing this uh, in this case, and, and we're obviously recording this on Sunday, uh, and, and whether allowing the, the area round will start a Tuesday, but uh, the, the big thing with, with 1A, I think, is that a lot of our best teams and most successful teams to this point are just now kind of getting in the mix because 1A obviously has has buys for the for the district champions. So uh, this is a kind of the, the the first times a lot of those teams are getting an opportunity. When you look at some of those teams, you know, like the the Pretties, the Huckabees, the Eulas. Uh, I mean, some of these teams that, that I mean, have been state ranked was your Monday had a great year. So they're, they're in that mix. And then you and then, then you've got a team like May, who was a really really good team, a ranked team that was in, just in a tough district. They actually had to play a, a, a Bidish game, but. Yeah, I, I think the, the the big thing with the area around in one A is that you start to get those district champions in the mix, and then it gets uh, gets a whole lot of fun. Okay, jumping up to Class Two A, uh, again, we do not know how these matchups uh, did turn out because this is pre-recorded. But what a selection of matchups heading into this week, Dan Stanford and Hamilton, Anson Lipan, Haskell against Poolville, Cisco Santo, uh, Saint Sab is still in there as of Sunday night. They were still in there. Goldthwaite's in there. Lots of good matchups, uh, lots of lots of entry. Yeah, I think the thing with Class 2A that I found the most interesting, and it was not surprising at all to me, is the success that Districts 10 and 11 had in that opening round. District 10, which has uh, Haskell, Stamford, Anson, and Cisco, all four of those teams wanted to advance the area round. And then in District 11, you had uh, – you had three of the four wins. So that, that, that I thought was really neat. It really did, like you said, create some really interesting matchups. Uh, Lipan's a, a really good team. They, they advanced. Poolville was their second place team. They advanced. And then the one uh, that, that uh, is interesting for our, for our purposes in our area is that Santo got a, got him a big win against Valley Mills to earn that uh, area round matchup with Cisco. So uh, I think what you've seen in that classification is two really strong districts that uh, they kind of did their part in the, in the by district round to create some really intriguing area round matchups. Also in two way, they're still alive. Colorado city with me and Monroe back in the lineup uh, and for Sam winning uh, their by district game uh, over wing 39, 36 uh, to face sundown in the area round. Let's jump up to class three, a Jim, Ned and Merkel were two of the ones that escaped uh, the weather last week, late last week, both of them coming away with wins. Jim Ned beat Reagan County 52-23, Merkel over Crane 55-40. to And a shocking upset. We did not see this one coming. Bowie downed Brock 36-34. Not often that we see the Lady Eagles bow out in the by district round. No, that was that to me was kind of the, the news of that or that first round in 3A for our area was, was Brock getting upset. But uh, I do think it's interesting and, and worth pointing out that this Brock team was not quite to the level that some of the ones they've had in the recent past. They, they had some losses on their schedule that uh, 
that Brock teams may not incur during the regular season. They finished second in that district to a really good Peaster team. But still, I think you and I both expected Brock to get through that buoy, that test, and get into the second round, and they didn't. And then uh, the other big story is weather. Yeah, I think that's the, the, the thing that kind of probably impacted us in our coverage plans most was the weather. We had just a lot of uh, scheduling changes due to the to the winter storm that's that's been uh, just kind of sitting on our area for a while. So, uh, but, but one that I that I was really kind of disappointed to see get postponed over and over again because I was looking really looking forward to that matchup is probably one of my my favorite just on paper favorite matchups of that first round was Ballinger and Cahoma, and they were just one of those games that just continued to get postponed and postponed, but. Weather really kind of played havoc on a lot of our team schedules. And now some of our teams are going to have to kind of have to scramble because you've basically got the by district round backing up into the area round. And it's going to be uh, kind of a mess here a little bit. But uh, I mean, it is what it is. You got to be able to adjust and, and, and uh, respond. But uh, it definitely made made planning difficult. All right, jumping up to Class 4A, Region 1 Dan's the toughest advertised. We lost Big Spring. They fell to Canyon. We lost Snyder, who fell to Hereford. Stephenville did take a step forward. They did beat Wichita Falls Hershey in the by district round, advancing to a, a, a matchup with Bridgeport, which is, as of this taping was still TBA. Uh, so we do not have the results of that yet. But the Honeybees did advance and enter this week, enter this week rather, at 21 and 2, one of the best teams out of SHS we've seen. Yeah, and I don't think any of those uh, those by district outcomes were really surprising. Uh, Canyon is obviously a state power every year playing at the class 4a level uh it makes them even tougher i think uh, so that's going to be a, a tough matchup looking down the road for stephenville if they can advance and get to that i think that's going to be one of those big time challengers in that region but uh but yeah so things just kind of went as expected uh but uh but good for the honeybees to get into the area around i think we, we expected that and uh and we're looking forward to seeing kind of just how far they can take it now now we would love to talk about boys pairings but uh, we've got a we've got a problem here. We've got weather that is going to be just wreaking havoc on any would be tiebreakers heading into the early part of this week. Um, and as of this taping, we really have no idea what effect it's going to have on time, location. Uh, you know, if they have to push it back a couple of days, the the UIL then may just uh, eventually just have to step in and say, okay, this is third place and this is fourth place. Let's yeah. flip a coin, whatever. Yeah, I mean, you have to see, see some coin flips, but there were uh, uh, to, to some interesting outcomes as a result of the weather, even. Uh, and, and you look at the District 45A, which has Cooper and Wiley. Cooper had a really tough uh, regular season finale scheduled at Lubbock Monterey, who they beat in double overtime in, in, in Abilene. And that game got wiped out. They, did, they decided they're not even going to make it up. So by virtue of that, Cooper wins the outright title. They were a game ahead going into that one. So, so Cooper... Uh, claimed their first district championship since 1996. So a, a really strong season for that bunch. And then Wiley made the playoffs as well. And then locally, we also have Abilene High heading the playoffs as uh, their district's third place team. So there's some interesting outcomes. I think when you look at, uh, I mean, 3A, there are a couple of teams that I thought that had uh, really strong district showings. Wall was one. Wall, Wall really came on in district time and, and had a really, really good district season in a very, very tough district. I, I expect – that league district six three a to have similar success to what we saw in in ten two a on the girls side. I, I would not be the least bit surprised to see that district, which has Wall, San Angelo TLCA, Ballinger, and Jim Ned. Uh, I would not be at all surprised to see all four of those advance to the area round too. So there's some interesting storylines going into the playoffs. But like you, I wish we had a little bit more certainty. This is this this weather has really made things very difficult. Uh, to, to, for these schools to navigate, it's made it very difficult to plan. It's kind of made it difficult to do some forecasting, even just because you, you don't know what it's going to look like quite yet. But uh, but as soon as we have pairings, y'all will see them. Uh, I, we're, we're excited to see what the matchups are. I, I, I love this time of year. I, I think when you've got the girls basketball uh, playoffs going into the second week, you've got the boys basketball playoffs starting. This is just such a fun time. You get to pick, you know, you get to look at the pairings, pick the best matchups, figure out where you're going. And, and generally speaking, you get a lot of great games this time of year. So. Uh, I'm excited. I, I'm excited to get this going, and I'm uh, looking forward to getting this weather behind us. Also, Dan, as always, in Class 3A, we, we, we'd be remiss if we did not mention the Brock Eagles, who finished in District 14-0 with a huge win over their arch rival, Peaster, tonight. That's always big for them. 24-2 and regular season finish. They could uh, We could see them in San Antonio. It's possible. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Here's what tells you that Brock is really, really good. 
is they beat Peaster twice. And both games were very good. This last one on Saturday was a one-point game, 64-63. But these are two teams that both have a chance, I think, to make a run uh, to the state tournament and perhaps even win one. Uh, but I like that district as a whole, too. I think that's an interesting district because you've got below Brock and Peaster, who are who are good, you know, a good s- couple steps above the rest. But Dublin's an interesting team. They play such a fun, fast-paced style that that's an interesting team to watch. And then Early had a solid year as well. They were they were a very competitive team. So uh, it's going to be fun to see how that that district does in the in the playoffs as well. But Brock, I think, is probably if I were just kind of betting uh, to start, I would put probably them at the top of our list as far as teams that have. Uh, have a shot to get to, to San Antonio. Okay. Uh, in the class two, a ranks teams that have a shot at making at least a very deep run. In my estimation, uh, two ball clubs that I like, I like Goldthwaite. I like San Saba. Um, and this, uh, this district 10 group, that's a nice grouping, especially the, the top three there, Albany and San Cisco are teams that might do some damage. The Cisco ball club's got some athletes. I like that district too. I think, I think uh, that's got, it's four deep with quality teams. And at the top, yeah, Cisco, uh, Anson was an interesting team. Anson, Anson really made some really strong strides during district play. They beat that Cisco team, uh, which is obviously a big deal. And then this Albany team is, is one to watch as well. So I agree. I, I like that district. I'm excited to see how it does in the playoffs. In your estimation, how far can the surprising Winters Blizzards get entering postseason at 21-4? and four? Uh, A lot of hoopla around them. It's going to be interesting to see how far they get when you start throwing playoff pressure on them. Yeah, no, Winter's an interesting team. They, they've got uh, a couple of kids who are, who are really good players. They got a couple – they got some good athleticism. They play a lot of defense. Uh, I, I like that team. I'm excited. And then you've got Coleman, which lost to them by single digits. Really close, a bucket uh, here or there. They could have they could have won that district. So I think Winters and Coleman are both teams to watch. Uh, sea City was solid. But, uh, but yeah, Winters is it kind of in the midst of a, of a basketball renaissance, and uh, it's going to be fun to see if they can turn that regular season success into playoff success. Okay, and with that, it's just about time to bring on Herm League girls basketball coach Dwayne Hopper. But before we do that, we want to thank our sponsors, first and foremost, of course, Capital Farm Credit, who brings you these Wednesday night podcasts free of charge throughout the school year. Also, for the love of the game broadcasting, and our old friend Terry Slavens, owner of K-Legs 93.5 FM out of Breckenridge, 97.7 FM KATX FM out of Eastland, Classic Country, 1330 AM out of Graham, 94.7 FM KWKQ out of Graham, KR00 1430 AM out of Breck, and KWBY 98.5 FM out of Ranger. That is for the love of the game broadcasting. Also, Phil Hill of the Abilene Realtors Group, big supporter of local athletics. If you're in the market, give Phil a call at 325-669-5153 or visit his website at philhillproperties.com. And finally, Jack's Road Boring and Snyder, Dirt Sales and Services. With experience and service you can count on, Larry Green is the man to call out there. Give him a shout at 325-575-8004. That's Jack's Road Boring and Snyder. And with that, Dan, it's just about time to bring on Dwayne Hopper, the man that they were calling the Mick Jagger of Class 1A basketball. He was that popular when he first came to town and really started winning. And you know what? He's still winning. Yeah. And, uh, Dwayne's, a, Dwayne's a little bit younger than Mick Jagger. But, uh, no, he's, he's a guy. Although yeah, you're starting yeah. to look like Keith Richards. Appreciate it. <laughs> but, yeah, no. uh, uh, but, yeah, the, Dwayne's a guy that's done a tremendous job. He's a really uh, enthusiastic, charismatic guy. I, I, I enjoyed Getting, out, getting him on here to talk to him about his program because you can just you kind of feel that uh, enthusiasm when we had him the last time on our audio podcast. So uh, it's going to be fun to talk to him here, get him on video, and, and let him brag on his program a little bit because they've got a lot to be proud of with the season they've had. And joining us now via Zoom, Hermley girls basketball coach Dwayne Hopper. Coach, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Coach, uh, jumping into the questions, uh, let's let's talk about this season and the progress, the growth that you've seen thus far oh man it's been awesome to watch them i mean we go from last the past three years of being in the regional finals every year and winning it two out of three years and a big part of that was we had two seniors that did a lot for us one in particular makia i mean she averaged about 25 points 15 rebounds five steals and so that's hard to make up i mean you don't you just don't have those players walking around your hallways they're very special and so we had sort of had to do it by committee And usually in the summer, we sort of figure some things out about our team, get some summer ball going. But with COVID, we weren't able to play very much. And so a lot of that growing and 
figuring things out happened when the season started. We started actually playing some games. So that was frustrating for me, losing some games. I thought we shouldn't have lost and um, not playing as well and just figuring some things out. But that happens when you got five freshmen and four sophomores. And so now we're at a point where I think we're playing our best basketball. We can do some things better, but we're starting to get things going the right way. Coach, I admit to being one of the doubters uh, because when Gonzalez graduated, I thought, okay, they're going to they're gonna have to really make a major adjustment. And I don't know if they can do it or not because she was so uh, – I mean, she was such a big part of your offense. She was a big part of your rebounding. She could defend, run the floor, handle the ball. She was your, your team leader. And yet you, here you are. You've managed to compensate for it. Right, yeah. I mean, she was – I think – I think a lot of people were in the same boat as far as doubting us. I think <clears throat> some girls on our team thought, hey, we can't get this done. We are we don't know what to do. And, like, I had to tell the girls, I said, she ain't walking through the doors. Like, she's gone. That She ain't coming back for a special practice or a game or something. And so I think it took them a little bit to figure out, hey, our seniors now, hey, we got to we gotta do some things. Like, we used to just pass the ball to her and be real passive because she did so much for us. And, and when you take that away – you like you, you throw them in the fire, really. I mean, I threw those seniors and I said, hey, you're gonna have to get it done. Like, I need points out of you now. Like, I don't need you to be just a passer, a defender. We need you to score. And it took them a little bit, but now they've, I mean, they've, if we could have had these girls play like this last year, I mean, we would have been so much better. And so I think it was a learning curve for me too of, hey, I have this really good player, um, but I put too much on her plate, I think sometimes, and it's biting me in the butt a little bit now, but we're starting to figure it out. And, and Dwayne, you mentioned that y'all did have some losses early in the season. Y'all really went through a stretch there where you struggled just a little bit, I guess, yeah. with a with a younger team and with with girls who hadn't been in that situation uh, before. Kind of just how were y'all able to handle that and kind of respond to some of those early losses? Man, I didn't handle it very well. I was fresh. I'm not starting off my career going to state and then going to state and then going to regional finals. I mean, you're just used to winning, and the girls got used to winning, and uh, I think we took it for granted how – how hard it is to win, even at our level. I mean, it's tough, um, especially when you play bigger teams. And <clears throat> I think it just took, instead of like pointing fingers at girls a little bit where, hey, you didn't do this. It was, hey, what can we do better? What can I as a coach do better? What can we as a team do better? What's our identity? And I think it took us almost, I mean, right up in, I think even in district, we were figuring out, hey, what are we good at? What can we do good that other teams can't do so well? And once we found our identity, now they we run with that. And, hey, we're good at this. We're, we're not going to worry about anything else. We're going to focus on what we're good at. And that's helped a lot. And one thing I noticed just watching you coach is, uh, I mean, you coach those girls hard. Like, you, you get on to them and, and you, you have, have very high expectations and demands of them. I guess just talk about coaching the girls game and, and kind of being able to do that and kind of balancing, coaching them hard with, with letting them know that you, you do love them, you do care about them. Yeah, I mean, that was a – I used to coach in the summer and everything. I never yelled. I was just like, whatever. Just they messed up. They didn't mean to mess up. But then as soon as it became like my job and I was the first scrimmage, I'll never forget we played at Roscoe. And I never really yelled in practice that much. But then as soon as we got to a game, it just all of a sudden like I flipped the switch and I was yelling and screaming and hey, and all the all the girls were like, what the heck? My wife even came home and was like, Where did that yelling come from? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> but now I guess I'm just real passionate about it. And I, I tell the girls all the time, I say, listen to what I'm saying, not my tone. I mean, I just get into the game and I'm very animated and I'm, and even refs, I sometimes yell at them, but I'm not meaning to yell. Just, that's just who I am. And I think I've learned this year that so especially some of our young girls aren't ready for that yet. And I chewed their butt the first game. And they're like, Oh, well, their eyes got real big. They ain't junior high anymore. And it shocked them a little bit. <clears throat> but then sometimes you also got to pull them aside and say, Hey, I love you. I appreciate what you're doing. You did this good. I just, I know you can do better. And that's my whole thing is like, my expectations are high, whether we have the best player in the state or whether we don't, I think we can go a long way and I think we can be good. And so it, next year, the 10 years from now, that's what I think we'll be good. We'll have a chance every year. Okay. Coach. So you're kind of touching on the next question. Uh, I've, You've stayed loyal to Hermley. Uh, a lot of guys in your position with all the success you've had at uh, at that level, there's going to be people, you know, taking a good look at you and inviting you up to take a look at their facilities and all that. You have stayed loyal to Hermley. I'm impressed with this. Yes, sir. Um, I mean, when I first came out of college, I wanted, I wanted to be a head coach bad. I, I think I was ready. I was like, I don't want to really be an assistant. I said, I've had some good coaches. I've learned from the guys. I think I'm ready to be a head coach. 
but no one else thought I was ready. And so I applied everywhere in Texas. I mean, all around Abilene, anywhere. I was just wanting a head job. And Hermley was the only one that gave me a chance. And so that means a lot to me. That's special to me. They gave me a chance. I mean, our district school, Ira, it's a big rivalry. I applied at their school and they didn't give me, they didn't even reply to my email. And so like some of those schools that come and like offer me and say, Hey, will you come here? I'm like, well, you didn't give me a chance when I first came out of college. And so um, maybe that's me being stubborn or I don't know, but or hard headed, <clears throat> but I appreciate her when they gave me my first job. We've had success and I've had offers and people, Hey, say, come here and look at this. But I wanted to just not be a, I don't know, a talent chaser. I didn't want to have good girls and be good for a few years and then run and go chase some other talent. I wanted to see what we can do here and what I could start from the ground up and see how well we could do. It didn't take long for you to uh, to really gain some popularity uh, in Hermley. Uh, we, you know, they were calling you a, a a rock star. I remember just when you had first started out, you were a rock star. We were like you were saying you were the uh, the Mick Jagger of Hermley up there, kind of joking about it. But uh, you really have been well treated up there. They really do like you. Yes, and that's another reason we stay. They take care of me, and they take care of my wife, and uh, she's she's my assistant coach now. The past two years, and so coaching is a family business. Like you, it's not a job. It's just like what you, it's a, it's a lifestyle. And so for Hermley to take, take that in consideration and involve my wife. And, um, we have people in the stands that watch our daughter and you just don't find that everywhere. If I go to some big school, it's going to be hard to do that. And so here in the small town, small community, um, people really care for you. They care about your family. They care about your kids. And that's a big reason we stay here too, is they treat us well. And you've had a little bit of time now between your, your two state champion or state uh, tournament appearances. I guess mm -hmm. you just kind of reflect on those. Obviously, you had a lot of success as a player as well, both at the high school level and college level. And then you, you jump right into coaching and or, or coaching in, in the, the state tournament in your first two years. I mean, just what was that like? And just kind of looking back now, uh, just kind of how would you describe those memories? Oh, it was awesome. I mean, uh, going as a player when I went at Wiley was cool. And having a run in college was awesome. But when you're a coach, there ain't nothing like it. I mean, it's so much sweeter, I guess you say. Um, just seeing, hey, those girls, when I first got here, we don't really think we can go to state. We didn't, they've never been. They never had that success. And seeing them gradually go and then having that success, man, it's awesome. For, the, to, for those kids to experience it, they've never experienced it. And for me to have a small part in that, it's awesome. Um, I think a lot, big part of that is what I had at, Wiley and Harden Simmons. I mean, we had lots of success. I was on good teams, had great coaches. And so that left an impact on me that it's it's hard to get it done, but also like if you put the work in and you just work every day, that we'll have a chance to be good. And I mean, that's how it was in Wiley. Those expectations were just high. And Harden Simmons, the expectations were just high. And so coming here, I, I knew nothing less. So I just Hey, here's the bar. You, we're either going to meet it or we're going to fall short, but that's I'm not going to lower my bar at all. And the girls take to that. And now, I mean, last year we didn't go to state and it was a huge letdown. And it's like, oh my gosh, we're not in the state tournament. I mean, it's, and before, before that was never the thought process. And now this year, I mean, all the girls, all the fans, they want to go to the state tournament. And so that's really cool to see that change, the culture change over the past few years. And that's what's most, that I had a small part in that of changing that culture. In high school and college, it was already established. I mean, I just showed up, that's what the culture was, either do it or get out. And so now to have a part in that's awesome. Coach, it's, it's pretty common for the big country area to send a 1A girls team to state. That happens quite often. Mm -hmm. But once we get there, uh, we generally run into somebody out of that panhandle area. And it's been a huge hurdle. Very few of our teams have, have won the state championship. What makes the panhandle as good as it is and how do we overcome it? And I think what well, like I said, the culture, I mean, well, we've learned in NAS the past in that my first two years. And I knew about NAS, but I didn't know about them that well. I found out real quickly how good they are. And I think those teams are just their parents did it, their grandparents did it, your sisters and brothers did it. I mean, they just expect to be good. They're gym rats, they live in the gym. And so when they get to that stage, it's nothing new to them. Like, hey, we were here last year. We were here two years ago. My mother played in the state championship. It's not a big deal to them. And really, for us, like going, it was, man, all right, we're just happy to be here. And those teams, they expect to be there. They expect to go there and win it. And I think that culture 
just speaks volumes to basketball in the panhandle, the Lubbock area. I mean, that's just – it's not just one or few teams. It's a lot of teams. Like, it's always Region 1 that usually wins the state championships, boys or girls. And so I think it's just a culture of basketball is up there, and it's important to you. Can you talk about Region 2, uh, the overall quality of it this year, some of the ball clubs that you're uh, keeping an eye on? Um, Region 2, I think it got better when um, – Eula and May joined. They were my first few years. They were in Region Three, I think, and they came back to Region Two, which is awesome for our region as far as competitiveness, but not so good for the teams that want to get out because they've had a they've had a culture. They've had boys and girls. Hey, we've been good at basketball before. It's important to their community. It's important to their school. And so those join that district joining, I think, helped our region a lot. And then very best is good. Obviously, they won it last year. They have almost everyone back, I believe. And then I think our district is pretty good. I think Westbrook, who won our district, us who got second, and Highland, I think all of us can go make a run in the playoffs. I think our district was pretty good. Those top three were good. And so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. And you you mentioned a little earlier about uh, having played for good coaches. You, you look at Russell Perkins at Wiley, Craig Cars at, at Harden Simmons, two guys who had a lot of success that were very different uh, as far as individuals and kind of mm-hmm. philosophies. Uh, what uh, kind of influence did they have on you maybe as mentors and as have you kind of taken parts of what they did coaching wise and did what you do? Oh, yes, of course. I mean, Coach Perkins, I think, is the still to this day. I've talked to lots of coaches now that I've been a coach. I still think he's the smartest coach I've ever had a dealing with. I mean, he knows X's and O's like anything. I still call him if I have, hey, uh, this team does this. What can I do against it? And he immediately has a response to it. He doesn't have to think about it, anything. He's just so smart, X's and O's. And then he was really good into getting you to buy into it. Like he got us to buy. He he wanted us to be good, of course, but he he made it seem like we wanted to be good. Like he made it, he put it on us. And I think that's real important for a coach. And that's what I struggle with sometimes is I want it well. I want to be good, but the girls might not want it as bad. And he did a good job of making us want it. Coach Cars was good as far as relationships, and he's seen everything on the floor. He know he's seen a bad call. He's been in every situation, and so like we'd have a tough loss or something, and we'd be heartbroken or whatever. It was nothing to him because he's had those before. We'd have a big win, and it was nothing to him. And so th- those just handling the highs and lows I learned from him, and handling kids and relationships, he taught me a lot. Dwayne, I, I got to uh, cover you as a player at Wiley in my early years out here. Uh, mm-hmm. And one thing that always kind of struck me just to, in your playing style was you were kind of that blue-collar guy that was was willing to do all the dirty work, and, and you did everything well. I mean, you just, you, you made it a point to, to be a good rebounder, to be a good passer, all of those things. How has that kind of uh, influenced you? I mean, be, being a guy that was kind of that, 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 that blue-collar garbage man sometimes, how, how did that kind of – how has that influenced you as a coach? And I think that's the way we play, and that's the way I – that's how I made my – not earning because I didn't make any money from it, but that's how, I, that's how I played. That's how I got minutes. That's how I contributed to the team. I was never, like, super fast or super strong or super athletic, and none of our girls just have that. I mean, we had Makia, of course. She had all those things way more than I had. But as far as, like, 1A level, you usually don't have just six-footers or just stud girls. It's just hard to find, and so – I put uh, our slogan is NWH, nobody works harder. And so our girls have bought into that. We work really hard in the summer. We might not be very fast or strong or tall, but we're going to outwork you, whether it's rebounding or we're going to know the play better than you, or we're going to run as fast as we can. We're not going to take a second off. And I think you can beat a lot of people that way. And as far as coaching, that's what I try to do. Like I watch countless hours of film and I talk to coaches all the time of what I can do because I can't just show up to the game and out coach you. Like I don't, I don't have that ability yet. I haven't been doing it long enough. And so I'm always trying to see how can I outwork you though, before the game starts. And that's what I tell our players all the time. Like we got to win the game before it starts. We got to outwork people. And then when we get there, we can just roll with it and see what happens. And we, we had talked to you a little bit about, about, uh, about Hermley, what's meant to you about the, 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 your coaching career. And I was just kind of wondering maybe what some of the, the ultimate goals you have uh, in coaching. Obviously, you played college basketball. Is, is that an aspiration to coach at that level or anything? What, what would you say are kind of some of the ultimate goals as a coach? Right. Um, I want to see, like, for a goal in Hermley, of course, is I want to see a co- class from sixth graders when I had them when they were in PE all the way to seniors. I think that would be really cool to grow up with kids. And I've done it – this is my first year to see a freshman graduate or to play for me as a senior. And so that's really cool to watch. So that's a personal goal for me here in Hermley. 
Uh, as far as career goals, um, I don't really – as far as where I coach is like 1A through 6A, I don't really care. Um, when I have kids, I have – when they play, I would like to go maybe coach in college and be an assistant and um, just see how the college world works. It, I, it's interesting to me. As a player, I, I loved it. But as a coach, I think it's a little different because you don't grow up with those kids. You don't – you just go get them and they just show up. And so I think it would be sort of a challenge to see how to coach different in college. Coach, in your profession, bad calls go with the territory. You're all going to get calls you don't like, that you disagree with. Uh, I've seen you coach a number of times. I really haven't seen you lose it out there. Uh, well, can you talk a little bit about um, – now, I'm just – maybe just a, it's a luck of the draw thing. I don't know. But what's your uh, – What's your philosophy on, on dealing with the refs and dealing with these situations? You work them or do you kind of build relationships? How do you approach it? Yeah, my first year, I was awful. We didn't. And so in Wiley, we used Abilene chapter. And so I had all the Abilene refs. And my first year, we did not use Abilene chapter. And so they refed, we used Permian Basin. Nothing against that. I was just wasn't used to those guys, didn't know how they called. And so I would lie into them and I would yell. And sometimes I would get our players riled up who would get our fans riled up and in the long run, it would hurt us yelling about a travel call that they didn't call. And so now I've sort of learned to back off. And some of that is we use Abilene now. And so some of those guys ref me when I was in high school and I have relationships with them. And so it's real hard for me to yell at them when they used to <laughs> ref me in high school and I used to do the dumb crap all the time. <laughs> and, so, and so I was like, yeah, I used to be that player that traveled or uh, um, had over the back or pushing somebody. And so, it's hard for me to yell at another at the ref when another player does it when I did it with the same guys. But and then my wife and other coaches, I watch good coaches and I talk to them and I say, like, How do you not get so upset? And they said, It's not, it doesn't do anything for you to get upset about it. And I'll talk to refs and say, Hey, can you watch this for me? Or I didn't like that call. But as far as yelling, so, most of the time it does more bad than good. And so I've I've tried to learn to back off a little bit. And my wife helps me a lot or being on the bench. I, I know a lot of these guys. I know a lot of them by name, a lot of these, these officials, uh -huh. and it would be tough to yell at, uh, at them. You know, how do you yell at Rob Durham? You know what I mean? <laughs> how do you, how do you, it's Rob. How am I going to yell at him? So yeah, I can understand. Um, if you were, let's say uh King for a day, what, uh, what rule change would you make in, in high school basketball? If you could just change something, what would you change? Ooh, that is a tough one. We get the same answer every time. That's a tough question. <laughs> if I could change any rule, then it would be – 10 seconds, I think. We press a lot, and I think 10 seconds is too much to get across half court. And it seems like we always get like 9.9. .9. I always ask the rest of my, hey, that's 9.9. .9. He's like, yep, we were so close to 10. I think if that would go – like eight is for college, I think. And so if we had eight, I think we'd be a lot better personally. And so I would change that rule. Okay. And well, as, a, as a pressing coach, you'd probably press for – you'd probably push for like a four-second rule. You know? <laughs> yeah. One at four. <laughs> but uh, we, we've been closing our, uh, our, our interviews out with the, really the same question for, for all the coaches that we've, that we've talked to, the basketball coaches. Uh, and that's about a shot clock. And you obviously played college basketball, so you've played with a shot clock, you've played without a shot clock. High school obviously has some different challenges there. Would you be uh, an advocate for the high school shot clock, or do you like it better how it is currently? Uh, I, that's tough. Some games I really like it as far as how it is played now. But then there's some games where, like, we're the better team and the other team knows that, and they just hold the ball. And it's really hard for us to – like, you can – you can make games close that way. But also on the other end, there's some people that they're much better than us. And I'm trying to, Hey, <laughs> let's slow it down. Let's hold the ball. And so I might want just a shot that way. It's even across the board, whether we play a good team or play a bad team, they got to shoot in a certain amount of time. And I don't know how, what that time is, but 30 seconds, 35, something. And I don't really, we shoot the ball faster than 30 seconds. And I think most teams do, but, It'd be nice every now and then for those teams that want to hold it out. Would you have a difficult time finding somebody to run the shot clock for you? Some some schools are having a challenge just to get somebody to keep the book. You know, uh, we might. We're lucky here. We've had a um, Lori Williamson. I'll give them. Uh, she's been doing our books for thirty years, and so she's mm -hmm. seen a lot of bad basketball and a lot of good basketball. 
And then Kelly Dacus has been doing our clock for 25 years. And so we're really good at finding those two people. But I don't know if we could find one more um, in Herma. We don't have very many people to begin with. But those two really do a good job on our clock and books. Coach, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on you, of course. And best of luck. Yes, sir. Thank you all. And that was Herm Lake girls basketball coach, Dwayne Hopper. Dan, really, um, I don't know if this guy's getting uh, as much credit as he deserves with the job he's done at Herm Lake. And I think the job that he's doing this year in the absence of Gonzalez, who was really a superstar player for them, uh, really kind of demonstrates the quality of the work he's doing at that school and this program. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously, I thought he did a great job the last, you know, three years. But when you have a player that's kind of a generational type player like Kiki Gonzalez, it, it, it can maybe, I guess, blind some folks to just what a job you're doing as a coach. But you, this year they lose that player. They managed to get things on, on track. Uh, they have a, a really solid season in a tough district. And uh, they're right back in the playoffs. So uh, I, I think you're right that he's done a, a tremendous job. He's a guy that uh, I think that Hermley's very lucky to have, particularly as long as they've had him. And it sounds like uh, – he, he has every intention of, of, of sticking around and really building something there. So that, that I, I, I think is really neat. I always think it's neat when you've got coaches who are, who, who are, you know, grateful for the, for the opportunities they've been given and, uh, and loyal to their programs. And he's definitely been that at Hermley. So it's been cool to watch. I think that, uh, that uh, to, to me, there, there are few coaches in the state of Texas, young coaches with as bright a future as Dwayne Hopper has. So uh, it's pretty cool to get to watch that uh, in our area. All right, that's going to about wrap things up for the Capital Farm Credit Wednesday night podcast. Before we do that, we want to remind you that we have three separate subscription packages here at BigCountryPreps.com. We've got a monthly for five bucks a month. We've got a semi-annual six-month subscription where we knock that price down to four bucks a month. And then we've got an annual, a 12-month subscription where we knock the price down to three bucks a month, 36 bucks for a full year of Big Country High School athletic coverage. And it's important to note that our prices don't change. We don't start you off at this ridiculously low rate. And then when you're not looking, and boom, your prices uh, have been jacked up. We don't do that. Your prices stay the same here. And we'd also like to remind you that if you see a photo you like in any one of our galleries is available for just $7. You can click on that small shopping cart icon to the bottom right, follow that prompt and purchase as many of those as you would like. But uh, when we're out at these games, we take a whole lot of photos. It's something we enjoy doing. And it's something we're really proud of here at BigCountryPreps.com. All big country, all high school, all the time. Welcome home.